It's 2017. Actor Kit Harrington has appeared in the latest blockbusting title. British filmmaker Guy Ritchie directed him. Upon disc release, the title sold more than 1.8 million copies in its first week as part of a global industry now worth more than $108.9 billion. You'd be forgiven for flicking through a mental catalogue of all of Hollywood's latest releases, but in fact, I'm talking about Activision's video game, Call of Duty Infinite Warfare. The game situates itself as part of a growing trend. Video game companies using cutting-edge technologies in order to capture the performance of an actor for use in their final product. As of eight years ago, the gaming industry is worth more than Hollywood. So increasingly, we're finding our favorite A-listers appearing at the tips of our controllers. You need only look at some of the names who have been involved in the Call of Duty series. It begins to look more like a casting list for the latest Sam Mendes movie than it does anything else. But a character in a video game functions in many different ways to that of one on stage or in film. Think of the last video game you played. If you haven't played one recently, then imagine one. Begin to move around in that world. You'll soon begin to realize that the character functions as an extension of yourself, a mediator between our world and the digital world. You discover and explore through them. So it's fairly important that you have at least some kind of connection with them, right? I mean, you'll be spending a lot of time with them. Most games now take over 40 hours to complete. As well as that, in many modern games, such as in the hugely popular The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, you get to make the moral, or immoral, choices of the character, and so you get to decide the direction of the narrative. So you have to care about something in some way in order for you to be able to make that decision. It's not like film where you're an onlooker. You are directly implicated in this world. So character has to function in a believable way that really draws you in. Cue the actor. Now, the actor's job is to bring the character to life. But this can be an incredibly complex process. The amazing quality of graphics of modern-day games consoles means that designers are working in excruciating detail so that the character moves and functions in a natural, human way. Not all characters we control are humans, but they are humanoid in that they directly resemble us. So, what better model than an actual human being? There is still a high proportion of animation within the video game design process, but video game companies are using motion capture, facial capture, and voiceover as a means of capturing an actor's performance. We all know of Andy Serkis's memorable portrayal of Gollum in the Lord of the Rings series, but motion capture is possibly more widespread than you might think. If you've ever played the game The Last of Us, you've seen motion capture. If you've ever played the game, any game, in fact, from the Uncharted series, you've seen motion capture. If you've played any of the recent FIFA games, you've guessed it, you've seen motion capture. It's used in a huge amount of games. So what actually happens during the process of motion capture? Well, an actor will often wear a skin-tight suit made of spandex. And it'll be covered in markers, a bit like this. Now, with the help of a camera and a computer, the markers will get digitized into a sort of skeleton that records the movement of the performer. This is actually very similar to facial capture, where the actor will wear markers on their face, a bit like this, except now often they'll have a camera mounted on their head. The markers will pick up the actor's facial expression, and via the camera, it will be mapped digitally onto a computer. It's amazing. What's possibly more amazing is the fact that these processes often both work out as quicker and cheaper 
than if you were to purely use animation alone in the creation of the character. For the voiceover artist, well, you'll be recording your lines of dialogue in what's often a very small booth, but on a very sensitive microphone. As you've probably guessed, the character is then a combination of these different performances spliced together, with the little help of an animator, of course. This is why you might hear someone refer to themselves as a Frankenstein performer, because much like the monster from Mary Shelley's 1818 novel, the character is a stitching together of these seemingly autonomous performances. As you can imagine, this can be quite a fragmentary experience for an actor. So, how can we help? Well, we can begin by looking at the ways we currently train our actors and seeing if we might be able to adapt it to suit the needs of a video game performer. I've been looking into some of these challenges. Firstly, let's consider the use of a syllabus that really makes use of the imagination. As some of you may have realized, the title of my talk is in direct reference to theater practitioner Michael Chekhov's book, to the actor, where he strongly advocates the use of imagination in training actors. In many ways, it's even more important for a video game performer. Performance capture artist TJ Storm once said that the best directors he's ever worked with have been artists who paint with imagination. For an actor who has no stage, no costume, no makeup, no set, no lighting, sometimes not even a scene partner, imagination is crucial. Motion capture actor Oliver Hollis Lake once described an instance where he was supposed to be running out of a burning building. He turned to his director and he asked, what's the building made from? The director didn't know. It was all going to be burnt down anyway. What does it matter? Oliver responded and he said, you see, if it's made of timber, then I can respond to the pops and the cracks of the wood as it burns, and I can watch the singed material as it floats gently in the air. These are the details that really make a performance. It's the same for the voiceover artist. It may be yourself and a microphone, but if you don't really see or hear that monster chasing you, then we will know. For some people, that feeling of something not quite matching up in the gameplay is enough to make them stop playing the game completely. If the actor believes it, then we believe it. Actor Doug Cockle, voice of Geralt of Rivia from the Witcher series, once said to me that we can hear the lie. I strongly believe that imagination is like a muscle. It can be trained. And video game performers have to be the Olympic athletes of the imagination. Bear in mind as well that these performers are also making use of all of these different pieces of technology whilst giving their performance. For many newcomers, this can be particularly difficult. I mean, I'm not sure how many of us have had experience in a motion capture suit or in having a camera strapped to our head whilst trying to move around or even of just talking into a really great quality microphone. So many actors are amazed at how they sound on a really good mic. For The Witcher 3, Doug Cockle's microphone picked up the squeaking of his shoes. Just imagine the detail it could pick up in your voice. So if an actor's job is to give a natural performance, they can't be distracted by these pieces of technology. If distracted, they won't be able to fully commit to the act of believing in, to use the example from before, that monster chasing them. So if an actor can adapt their performance for camera, for film, then perhaps by giving them experience in this technology beforehand, we may be able to help them adapt to the video game medium. That way, as practitioners, we can help to foster a natural, believable performance that we can instantly connect with. Now, a comfortable actor is always a great thing. But the fact does remain. It is a fragmentary process. But I think this is something that we have a tendency to do as human beings, to break things down into bite-sized chunks, to compartmentalize. Now, by this, I mean that drama schools will teach people how to act, 
how to move, how to use their voice. We have acting coaches, voice coaches, movement coaches, all incredibly helpful for a whole number of reasons, but potentially problematic for a video game performer whose process of documentation is already so broken up, body, face, voice, that they need a sense of wholeness within their performance. If I was to say to someone that they are a voice actor, a voice person, I may therefore be very subtly suggesting that they can't then be equally as great at movement. But you see, when I speak, it originates as a thought in my mind before my body helps me to produce the sound. We are all integrated beings, and I believe we should be trained as such. If you were all to direct an actor and say, could you make it sound as though you're trying to tell me a secret whilst running? Well, someone trying to do this whilst actually running will probably give a much more believable performance than someone who's trying to do it while standing completely still. The body informs the voice, and the voice informs the body. If then the process of documentation is to remain compartmentalized, body, face, voice, then the actors need this sense of wholeness within their performance so that for us and them, it feels as though it originated from a thinking, feeling, integrated human being. Then the actor feels good, gives a great performance, and we can continue playing as these brilliant, exciting characters who hopefully we perceive as something whole and not as a construct of these separate components. Now, you might be thinking, or not, that aside from adapting a syllabus, what's a more practical way of addressing these challenges? I have you covered. It's probably going to be really expensive to buy a huge, fully equipped studio complete with shoe squeak microphones. Same as it's probably going to be quite troublesome trying to record 30 students in a room all with motion capture suits on. So, if we can create relationships with organizations, both organizations who currently train actors for the video game performance medium and ones who currently work in the industry, Centroid 3D is one of many examples, then the actor could get experience in the studio and maybe even employment and the studio get access to a fresh, exciting pool of talent. And of course, not forgetting the organizations who are creating and developing these amazing pieces of technology, the mocap suits, the microphones, the facial cams, now we have virtual reality gear. It's an extensive list. But by creating a mutual relationship, the actors could help shape the next generation of technology, and the creators and developers of the technology could shape it around the next generation of actors. Thus, the next generation of character is one built from a foundation of collaboration. Now, these are just a few initial ideas of a hugely complex subject matter, but we should continue to think about it together, and not just as actors or gamers. You see, the video game industry will continue to grow. It's an incredible opportunity of employment for actors, but it's also a medium that allows us to continue doing what we love as human beings, telling stories. As I've said, a comfortable actor means a natural performance. And that means characters that go down in modern gaming history amongst the likes of Joel and Ellie from The Last of Us, Nathan Drake from the Uncharted series, Geralt from the Witcher series, Dante from Devil May Cry, Ezio from Assassin's Creed, Master Chief from Halo, all character-driven series. The character is the heart and soul of these games, and it's the thing that we, as gamers, can't get enough of. The actor is a huge part of giving that heart a beat, and so we should be able to help them and provide them with the tools to be able to keep doing so. It's time that video game performance was on the syllabus. It's time that we considered it to be a legitimate and contemporary form of theatrical art, because that is what it is. Now, for those of us who aren't actors and gamers, the technology will still continue to develop. And much like our continuing love of phones and tablets, it'll affect most parts of our lives beyond just gaming. 
If technology continues to transform the way it has, well, soon we will need to completely readdress both what we mean by and how we construct character in a digital age. Be a part of that dialogue. Thank you.